What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny, Bush, and Sosa coming at you with a two-round Superflex mock draft. We're getting into the month of March, which means we're getting into pro day time. Unfortunately, we didn't have an NFL combine this year, but we're getting into true peak draft season, and we figured we're going to give you guys an updated version of the rookie mock draft that we did about a month ago. Now that we've watched a lot more of these players, we can talk about a two-round version of a, of a mock draft. So, Sosa, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, and maybe talk about your work before we get into this. All right. Yeah. Thanks guys for having me, I guess. Um, you know, I, I write over at PFF. I'm a fantasy analyst there. Uh, I also host a podcast called Locked On Rams for the Locked On Podcast Network, covering the Rams, obviously. Uh, and yeah, you know, I've been playing pretty much fantasy football for like 11, 12 years now, uh, getting to finally cover it full time, which is dope. Um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at QB's MEP. I'm always chopping it up, uh, pretty much anything NFL related. So uh, that's pretty much where I'm at. That's where you can find me. And um, I'm excited to uh, get through this one here. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Pump, pump to have you on, man. And for the rules of this specific mock draft, again, similar to the last one, it is going to be a 12-team simulated super flex mock draft, no tight end premium. So for the users at home, super flex, you can start up to two QBs, therefore... We're going to see quarterbacks flying pretty early in this one in comparison to a one quarterback league. So start off Sosa. You're the guest first overall pick. What do you got planned out at one one overall? I mean, you may as well make me the GM of the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars because I'm going Trevor Lawrence here. So, um, you know, if we aren't, if we weren't going uh, QB, QB premium, I guess you could say super flex here. Obviously I'd go elsewhere, but uh, with the, with the QB, you know, additive here, you got to go with the number one quarterback. And it's obviously a little bit tough for me. You know, I wouldn't be shocked if a guy like Zach Wilson maybe, you know, has a better rookie season in terms of the fantasy point output just because, you know, he's so mobile. And, and that's not to say that Lawrence isn't. But, um, you know, I got to go with the number one guy. I feel like he's the easiest projection to the NFL. Uh, he's going to, you know, presumably start from day one for Jags. Uh, and hopefully they can, you know, put some pieces around him on the offensive side of the ball, it's going to make his life a little bit easier. But, um, you know, he's got the mobility. He's got the accuracy. He's got the big arm. Uh, he's played in every big game you can imagine in college football. Uh, the dude's a rare talent. You know, he's special. A lot of people look at him as that Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning, you know, caliber of prospect. So uh, pretty easy for me here. I got to go with Trevor Lawrence. But, um, you know, I, I feel like I wouldn't be shocked at the end of the day if we do see some other quarterbacks get pretty close to what he can do uh, as a rookie. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. I think a lot of people are under the assumption that Trevor Lawrence is the 101 no matter what. I don't see it that way personally. I do think he is an Andrew Luck level quarterback prospect, but I also don't think he's bulletproof either. I do think he does have some holes to his game, mainly some plays under pressure. Sometimes of his uh, his downfield accuracy can struggle a bit, but either way, I think you're getting the best quarterback prospect in the draft. But that being said, if Zach Wilson or Justin Fields ends up as a Carolina Panther or a San Francisco 49er, they will be my number one quarterback for fantasy purposes. Because I'm a, I've said this on numerous occasions, I'm a firm believer of landing spot matters so much for quarterbacks. If you look back at the previous draft classes with guys like Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, all these guys went to established franchises that had a history of winning games and were able to develop their quarterbacks a lot easier than the Jets with Sam Darnold or the Browns with Baker Mayfield or some of these other struggling franchises. Yeah, no, I mean, you basically hit it on the head here. From what we know now, we know what Trevor Lawrence is. We know Trevor Lawrence is going to be the first overall pick. We know what Trevor Lawrence presents as a quarterback prospect in terms of the size, the mobility, the arm talent, the Konami code factor we look for in fantasy football. For those of you who are watching, Konami code basically introduces the concept of rushing quarterbacks adding a lot more value than supposed uh, immobile pocket passing types like Tom Brady. So, I mean, you're talking about it. Let's just explain it real quick. 10 rushing yards equals 25 passing yards. From that ratio alone, and then you mentioned one rushing touchdown is worth six points, one passing touchdown is only worth four in most standard leagues. So in that case, getting a guy who can add a lot to the uh, to his output in the rushing game, which Trevor Lawrence, I believe, can very well give you 400 yards, five rushing touchdowns per year as well. I think that's really unheard of to see four guys like we do in this class all having that type of mobility to add to their game. So I fully agree though. Trevor Lawrence is my number one overall quarterback and is my number one overall player in super flex rookie drafts. But aside from that, Corey, you got the second overall pick you kind of alluded to it, but who are you looking at here for those watching? They have a good idea. 
Yeah, so everyone knows my guy, Zach Wilson. I really love Zach Wilson. I think the the way that he plays the game is very schoolyard, very – I'm not going to be blasphemous here, but it's very much like how Patrick Mahomes plays the game. And if he can get into a situation the way that Patrick Mahomes did with the Kansas City Chiefs, with Andy Reid, with Tyreek Hill, with Travis Kelsey, with – everything that he had around him. And I think that situation is Carolina. And I think that situation could also be San Francisco as well. If they're able to get up to get him, then that's where I would, I would actually take Zach Wilson number one overall. But as of right now, this is kind of a tentative pick with me picking him one Oh two, because it looks like he might be a New York jet. And that is going to probably cause me to move him down and potentially take some of these running backs or maybe even Justin Fields over him. But as of right now, I'm going to go with my number two player on my board from a talent perspective, from where I kind of project his usage in the NFL and how he can provide that mobile aspect, as we talked about with Trevor Lawrence to the quarterback position. He also is just a master of creating big plays. So I'm going to go with Zach Wilson, quarterback from BYU, as the 102 in this draft. Yeah, I mean, I I fully agree. Again, you mentioned here, I personally have Fields and Wilson battling for that too, personally, in my own rankings. But for what Wilson represents, first of all, we do expect him to get the higher draft capital at this point with multiple rumors linking him at number two overall. Secondly, we mentioned, again, Konami code. Zach Wilson, most of his production in college was coming out of structure, out of the pocket, making plays to really the deep, the deep portions of the field with ease. I mean, you're talking about deep ball accuracy. He is by far the best in this class, in my opinion. I mean, you mentioned numbers alone. His metrics are just astounding. Some of the best we've ever seen. I mean, so, so you work at PFF. Y'all guys love him over there in terms of your overall uh, deep ball productions, deep ball percentages. I mean, he just absolutely blew it through the roof. Yeah, I mean, uh, Zach Wilson, you know, going into this past season, I feel like most people obviously didn't really talk about him. No one really knew about him. But um, I guess, you know, when you put together such a dominant season like that, uh, it's going to obviously put you on the map. And then when you look at a lot of the things, like you said, you know, his work out of structure, uh, his ability to kind of, you know, work off of platform and, out of the structure of a play is obviously very important. You see a lot of the best QBs in the NFL today, um, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, a lot of these guys that were in championship games, you know, a few weeks ago or a month ago. So yeah. uh, Aaron Rodgers, guys like that, that stuff pays now, you know, and um, ultimately you got to be able to make plays when they don't present themselves because those are the guys that are essentially great in the league, the guys that separate themselves from the guys that, you know, can play in the structure of a play. It's, all, it's a lot easier to throw to a guy who, you know, separates three or four yards at a time or whatever. So, uh, Zach Wilson, yeah, like you said, um, I think it's going to very much depend on where he goes. Obviously, like you said, if he goes to the Jets, a little bit less uh, excited, you know, about the spot, not to say that he can't overcome that. But at the same time, you know, if you can get him to a, a place like San Fran, like you mentioned, Carolina. where he can get to a play caller like, yeah, like Kyle Shanahan or, you know, Joe Brady, that's the kind of stuff that you can get really excited about. So, you know, I, I understand the pick here and uh, it's going to be very fun to see where he lands. But, you know, I don't know how the Jets could possibly pass him up at this point in time. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Uh, Alluding to that, I actually picked back-to-back here at three and four, and it's between two guys for me. I'm going to end up taking both of them because I got the luxury of picking that back-to-back, but the two picks in a row for me are going to be the first running back off the board, and that's going to be Najee Harris out of Alabama, and, of course, the third quarterback off the board, and that's going to be Justin Fields out of Ohio State. So for purpose sake, let's spice it up. Let's put a running back at number three overall. I'm going to be talking about Najee Harris out of Alabama. I mean, we did a prospect battles on him just a few weeks ago on the channel. This guy checks all the boxes. He is the most complete overall running back in this class. You mentioned the size, the ability on the goal line, the ability in the passing game. I mean, what this guy does, he can step in right away. You're talking about a team like Pittsburgh. You're talking about, heck, teams like Atlanta that could use a full workhorse back. I think he has the best overall profile in the entire class to be able to do so. And again, that receiving production I messaged, he can step in to that role right off the bat given just the prowess he presents in that. I've never seen a running back with as much verticality in the passing game that Najee Harris has. I mean, you're mentioning a six six, foot, two and 230 pound running back. It's absolutely absurd what he's able to do as a receiver. It's unreal. But yeah, what are your uh, thoughts on Najee uh, Sosa? Man, I'm really intrigued, you know. (laughs) Going into this season, I felt like a lot of people were kind of sleeping on him and, you know, talking about him as like this power back. And really, that's all of that he was, but, um, you know, after this past season, he's clearly like the number one running back, I would say on most people's boards, at least. And, uh, when you look at his ability to break tackles, uh, his ability to run in between the tackles, outside of the tackles, 
his ability to catch the ball, I think it's one of the more underrated parts of his game. I feel like Alabama could have, you know, used a little bit more of that in their offense maybe, but at the same time when you have guys like Jalen Waddle and yeah. Devontae Smith, you probably don't need to be thrown to your running back all that much. But uh, I think the dude's – I don't want to say special because I try to reserve that word for guys that are truly I'll otherworldly. The but dude's special. Man. The build yeah. that he has, yeah, the he's a great ability player. that he has for his size is special. It's not – I'm not going to call him Saquon Barkley because I don't think he's as good of an athlete as Saquon Barkley, but the type of size that he boasts and is exactly the same as Saquon Barkley size, like about 230 pounds over six feet. Like that's the type of size that you want from a guy that's going to hold up to a full workload in the NFL, a 250 carry 50, 60 reception type workload is exactly the type of output we get from guys like Dalvin cook and Christian McCaffrey and guys that can handle a workload like that. And I think Najee Harris is definitely worthy of going at the third overall pick. Danny, you talked about your fourth overall pick being Justin Fields. Yep. I, I think, and as I mentioned, if he goes to a great landing spot, he could very well be the number one quarterback in this draft class because I think his highlights are the best in this class, in my opinion, for Justin Fields. I think we get the consistency bug all the time and the Twitter scouts want to come out and say he doesn't throw with anticipation or whatever the hot scouting term that they heard on the internet that week. They want to dog on Justin Fields for that uh, for that trait, but – the reality is, is that Justin Fields has a lot of things that you can't teach. It's the reason he's one of the highest high school prospects that's ever come out at the quarterback position right behind third, Trevor Lawrence. Third that, overall, ever. Yeah, third in overall. that 2018 recruiting class, those two guys were neck and neck for some of the best quarterbacks to ever play high school football. So Justin Fields, if he can fix the consistency issues that he has, some of the issues that he has under pressure, and again, I feel like if he can go to a situation maybe like Atlanta where he's learning behind Matt Ryan for a bit, Maybe he goes to Carolina where he has the coaching of Matt Rule and Joe Brady. Maybe he goes to um, a San Francisco or something like that. If he goes to a great situation, the, the sky is the limit for this dude. I comped him to Cam Newton when I watched the guy because his ability on the ground is even more so than Zach Wilson and Trevor Lawrence's, in my opinion. He's a true dual threat quarterback as opposed to a mobile guy, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I mean, we've seen it on display these past two years at Ohio State, me specifically as a Michigan fan. This kid is special. And again, if he lands in a spot in a quarterback nest that can really nurture him again, Carolina, if he lands there, if he lands in Atlanta, one of those spots, you mentioned Joe Brady, Arthur Smith, those, those real coaches that can de develop a young quarterback with the amount of talent and potential that Justin Fields has. I'm all for moving him up my board. And to be quite honest, I think four is going to be his floor going mm -hmm. into these uh, super flex rookie drafts. Now, before we move on, I quickly want to interject. If you guys have made it this far in the video, comment happy birthday because guess what? You guys are going to be watching this on Tuesday, March 9th, and that is going to be my 21st birthday. So made it 13th minutes in. Comment happy birthday. Aside from that, let's get into the next pick. Uh, let me just check. So, Bush, you're back on the clock here, and uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, so Sosa teased the fact that a lot of people have Najee Harris as their number one running back on their board. I'm not one of those people because I have Travis Etienne as my number one running back. And the reason I have that um, as the case is because I think Travis Etienne gives you everything that Najee Harris can give you and actually a little bit more to some extent. I think Najee Harris probably edges him out as a receiver, especially for his size. But Etienne, in, from, in my opinion, and according to the metrics of PFF, is the better pass protector. And I also think we all know that Travis Etienne has the breakaway speed that Najee Harris probably doesn't have also. So the thing that I see with Travis Etienne is I see a Jamal Charles-like fantasy asset if he lands in the right situation. And Daniel Jeremiah from NFL Network actually compares him to Jamal Charles as his draft comparison for Travis Etienne. And that's very lofty comparison, obviously, because you're talking about a guy who's, whose ceiling or whose fantasy output was like borderline Hall of Fame caliber. So... I think what you get with Travis Etienne, if he can land in a situation where he's in like maybe a wide zone scheme like Arizona or like San Francisco or something like that along those lines, even Atlanta, I think would be a great fit for him too. Travis Etienne has that type of ceiling where when you're down 20 points in a fantasy matchup, you're just like, oh, I need an 80 yard touchdown from Travis Etienne because he can deliver that and more. He can give you everything that you want in the receiving game too. He had, I believe, the most receptions in the country for the running back position um, this past season. So I absolutely love this kid, and he's actually currently my 103. So to get him at 105 is really nice. Yeah, good value there. But yeah, uh, yeah, you, you mentioned it. You basically nailed it on the head with ETN. You mentioned uh, we did the prospect battles a few weeks ago. We, the viewers already know that ETN was your one. Najee Harris was my two. And it just goes to show that Najee Harris, 
he's more all around. Whereas ETN, again, he, you mentioned the breakaway ability, the ability uh, just in general to absolutely change the outcome of a game on one single touch. I do think ETN can provide that. Again, you mentioned the situation, let's just say hypothetically, the Cardinals to replace Kenyon Drake would make a ton of sense. Atlanta, we mentioned it with, with Najee. I think that I would think make Tampa sense. Tampa and Buffalo make Tampa a lot Tampa would make sense, sense. You know? yeah. So uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on ETN, uh, Sosa? Yeah, I think you guys summed it up well, you know. I think he leaves a little bit to be desired as like your legitimate running back when you're talking about a guy who has maybe a little bit less than ideal vision and he's not going to rip off that four to five yards every single play. But if you're talking about explosion, a guy who can legitimately take the ball to the house at any given time, um, somebody who can create a lot of yardage after the catch, after contact, that's ETN, right? And um, I was thinking about going with ETN in my next, which, you know, I am the next one up, but you made <laughs> my decision a little bit easier. Yeah, you made my decision a little bit easier here. I, I think this might be the first um, surprise of this draft because I'm also going to go running back, and I was deciding whether I was going to go with ETN or Javante Williams, but I got to go with Williams now. Obviously, you made my decision a little bit easier. Yes. Man, That's this a dude, very PFF if we're talking about, right Love there. it. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, man. it is. I got to shout out the team for that one. So, man, if we're talking about a guy that can create, you know, and that's the thing I think that separates certain guys coming out of college. It's like you look at Antonio Gibson last year, uh, a guy who never really played full time running back. He was a receiver transitioning to running back, but he had like legendary yards after contact, yards after the catch, tackle breaking ability last year. Uh, coming out of uh, where was he from? Actually, you was it UNC? I Memphis. can't even remember now. Memphis, um, Memphis, Memphis. Yeah, sorry, Memphis. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I got to go with Javante Williams, man. He's got um, just otherworldly numbers. He, he was bas basically broke the skill at PFF when he came to missed tackles forced. Uh, you know, he was the highest graded runner last year at, with a 95.9 grade um, in college football. So that's pretty impressive. Obviously, you look at all the yardage after contact. Uh, the most missed tackles the forced out of any running back yeah. in the class. Uh, yeah, I was about to say on your guy's scale an elusive rating over 215 and get this a 46.96 percent avoided tackle rate that is just absurd like absurd to even think about for reference i mean you mentioned the, by far the best in the class not even remotely close in terms of just the metric standpoint i mean javante williams is a special player and you mentioned like it might be a surprise as well for for a lot of people but me and bush are both on the, uh, I think I think he could be the first running back picked in the NFL draft. Yeah. Legitimately, I actually think that is a possibility. We, uh, if you guys follow NFL rumors on Twitter, there was a report yesterday that said um, Pittsburgh's really high on Javante Williams. It would not shock me if they pulled the trigger in their first with their first round pick on Javante Williams because this is a dude that I mean, some people might see this as a knock, but he doesn't have a lot of tread on his tires either. He he was uh, splitting time with Michael Carter this past year and the previous year too. So. If people see that that workhorse potential, that Nick Chubb, Josh Jacobs type of uh, elusive runner and tackle breaking ability, it wouldn't shock me at all if this guy's a first round pick in the NFL. Uh, uh, you hit hit the nail on the head. I mean, he reminds me of a Josh Jacobs with even a little bit more juice. That's what I see when I watch Devonte Williams play football. You're talking about the elusiveness. You're talking about the toughness between tackles. You're talking about just a fierce menace in the open space. I mean, Javante Williams is an absolute stud. And yeah, I mean. Mentioned this is sixth overall. He's currently number six on my overall rookie board. So I think this value is He's seven on mine. So he didn't reach for us. So, yeah. Uh, anyways, you do have the second of the back to back. What are you thinking here at seventh overall? Yeah. So this one was tough for me. I, I wanted to go receiver so bad. Um, but just, you know, looking at how the picks come out after this, I'm not going to be on the board for a little bit. So. If I don't go QB here, I feel like uh, my next choice at quarterback is not going to be all that great. So I'm going to have to go with Trey Lance uh, out of North Dakota State. Um, now, there's obviously, you know, some question marks there in terms of how quickly is he going to start when he gets to the NFL? You know, he doesn't have a lot of college experience, basically didn't play this past season. I think he only played in one game, um, only has one year really of college starting experience. But um, I mean, you also look at the fact that I think he's only 20 years old, so obviously super young. But man, when you're my talking idea. about just like <laughs> raw traits, at, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And, and look at us. We're talking about him. And yeah. so uh, you look at just like raw traits, athleticism, the ability. Like if we're talking just in terms of, you know, arm strength, speed, strength, size, uh, natural ability, he might be the most talented quarterback in this class. That's really how I view him. Um, I view him as similar, you know, to Cam Newton coming out. I, I think they're very similar uh, prospects in terms of the arm strength, the deep ball ability. Uh, the ability to keep the ball out of, well. you know, defenders. 
Yep. And then, uh, you know, you got that big strength, brute style of running ability. You don't see that from quarterbacks often. Not often are quarterbacks running over defenders, but uh, that's what the kind of stuff that Lance can do. And so even, when, you know, when you look at the North Dakota State offense, you've seen a lot of similar stuff like running a lot of veer, a lot of QB powers, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's it could be an issue in terms of how long it takes him to start. But at the end of the day, you know, if we look back, you know, two or three years down the line, I wouldn't be shocked if we are talking about, you know, Trey Lance as one of the better quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback out of this draft class. That's how much natural talent I think he has. Yeah, yeah no, I, you think too, probably he goes fourth of the of the top four quarterbacks. Do he probably goes the latest in the draft as well because of the one year starting experience at an FCS school? There's a chance he gets drafted to the best landing spot, the best situation for him to grow and develop potentially right. even behind somebody and uh, learn for a little bit of time. Because as you mentioned, it is, I mean, it's been a predictive red flag of quarterbacks in the past to not be one year starters because it generally speaking doesn't really work out. But you mentioned Cam Newton, it definitely worked out in his case. Um, for fantasy purposes and for Trey Lance's sake too he's the only QB in this class that rushed for a thousand yards which is yeah. ridiculous obviously was, uh, he went to his yeah, team yeah. he was on a team where he was clearly the best player on his team so a lot of the a lot of his rushing production probably came from the fact that he had a Superman kind of situation where he's like if if, if I don't run this nobody's getting any yards so uh, but you love to see that out of your franchise quarterback if you're drafting him and I think Trey Lance definitely has a chance to be one of the best QBs in this class. And that's saying a lot, given how talented I think all four of these guys are. Yeah, 100%. You alluded to it. 1,150 yards and 14 rushing touchdowns in 2019. Keep in mind, he was 19 years old in that season. Just absurd to even think about how productive he was as a 19-year-old kid. Carson Wentz wasn't Instagram. that productive. He came from Not that at all. Ball, but he wasn't that productive. And also, the one thing I've heard a lot about Trey Lance is maturity to his game from people that are better film <laughs> evaluators than I am. I think like the Daniel Jeremiah's and those guys have brought up the, the the maturity to his game, evidenced by the fact that he didn't throw an interception in 2019. I think that's something that I didn't expect to see when I watched Trey Lance. I expected to see kind of a sporadic, chaotic like athlete at the position, but he actually played very maturely and he just had some things obviously that he needs to clean up and that should come with experience and coaching. Yep, 100%. So uh, with that being said, Corey, back on the clock. Eighth yeah, overall. Yeah, I, I know where you're going. I, yeah, yeah, you know where I'm going. I can't believe I'm getting shirt. Jamar Chase right here. Um, Jamar Chase, to me, is also kind of the Trey Lance of the wide receiver position and, and kind of some uh, to some extent because we saw the production that this guy put up at age 19, obviously, um, for the historic LSU offense putting up a Bolitnikoff season. But I think there's so much more that this guy can bring to the table that he still has yet to develop. And the year off that he may have had this past year might have helped him to do that. I think this guy could add 10 pounds and become an AJ Brown, Chris Godwin type of yak monster in the NFL. I've said that on numerous occasions. I think Jamar Chase reminds me a lot of those guys, plus like a little DJ Moore as well. He He's a great athlete. He wins after the catch. He wins in contested downfield situations. Basically what I look for out of fantasy receivers is can you win at all three levels? Because that is the only way that you're going to get to be a Julio Jones type of fantasy asset. And I think Jamar Chase has that type of ceiling. And that's why I slightly lean, uh, lean him over Devontae Smith, who I think is very talented in his own right. I'm just going to quickly mention, I've probably hit the nail or hit the head on this nail or whatever. You know, you guys know the saying by now, <laughs> regardless. Anyways. He reminds me of Justin Blackman. Justin Blackman coming out of Oklahoma State back in, I believe it was 2012. 2012, 2012 fifth overall pick. And you mentioned in terms of pro production, Justin Blackman was a 1,900 yard or 1,700 yard receiver at Oklahoma State getting thrown footballs from Brandon Whedon when he was 28 years old in college. I don't know how that happened. But anyways, he reminds me exactly of Justin Blackman. You mentioned the production. You mentioned the size. You mentioned the play style. They're both physical outside receivers that can do a lot after the catch. And – I still firmly believe if Justin Blackman did not have his own mental demons, did not have his own issues off the field, he would have been a superstar. You're talking about a guy who, in his rookie season on Jacksonville, had 850 yards and five touchdowns with Blaine Galbert throwing him the ball. That just goes to show you the level of talent that was there. And I see it in spades when I watch Jamar Chase play. I mean, you mentioned here, eighth overall, I do think that's a very good value spot for him, for a guy that... I think his floor is sixth overall in the draft this year. I think if he's there at six for the Eagles, there's no shot that they pass him up. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great landing spot, wouldn't it, with Jalen Hurts, a guy who's not afraid to go let that ball uh, let the ball go. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, the dude's special, right? The dude's special. Uh, there's not really many that holes you can, uh, you can poke in his game. He can, you know, force missed tackles. He can work downfield. He can catch the ball and work with the ball in his hands. Um, I'm not really going to nitpick it. You know, he's a special guy, special talent. Uh, and when you look back to that historic season, like you said, in 2019, I mean, what more can you say, right? The guy was special. Yeah, and he yeah. relegated the the would-be offensive rookie of the year in Justin Jefferson to a guy that we viewed in a tier below Jamar Chase, right? So if Justin Jefferson was a guy that broke Randy Moss's rookie receiving record, what could Jamar Chase do in a great situation as well? So if Jamar Chase does go to Philadelphia, maybe he goes to, I'm not sure, maybe Atlanta wants to go after him or something like that. If he's in a situation where he's going to have um, other playmakers around him and a quarterback that can deliver him the football, I do think he has like a thousand yards as a rookie potential, uh, yeah. especially if he's spent this last year that he's been out of football working on his game potentially working on refining his route running, which is some people's knock on him, which I don't really buy too much stock into. Um, yeah, he definitely has that type of elite wide receiver one potential. So Danny, you're on the clock and I already see you clocked in both. Of the picks. <laughs> I, I, I clocked them both the quicks. Got to make it quick. Got to make it simple. I love my boy Jalen Waddle here, but Devonta Smith, his teammate is my wide receiver one. So I'm going to be taking him here at what ninth overall. And uh, to follow that up, a guy who, if he was at their wide receiver position, may very well have a case for number one overall. And that's going to be Kyle Pitts out of Florida. So start off, I'm going to talk about Devonta Smith. I mean, you mentioned from an overall, just looking at the film, right? Wait, 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 Devonta Smith has the best overall film in this class. You mentioned a guy, he does it all. He's got the route running. He's got the after catch ability. He's got immaculate hands. And really the only real downside that people have to him is, is he the most physical player? And his size because people say oh 180 pounds is not going to survive even though chad johnson was doing it for a 12-year career i mean it, it's not a concern of mine whatsoever devonta smith is special on film and quite frankly this is a guy you, i mentioned the route running the separation the hands and underrated verticality to plug in that lsu tape if you want any reference on how special he is in the air that nobody even talks about when they're referring to devonta smith so getting him here at nine overall for my wide receiver one I think is a slam dunk. Um, what are your thoughts on Devonta Smith Sosa? Dude, he's special as well. I remember yeah. uh, the, the easiest way for me to basically sum up the way I think of Devonta Smith is I remember last year, you know, watching uh, the Alabama offense, trying to get a gauge of guys like uh, Henry Ruggs and, you know, his teammates and whatnot, Jerry Judy. And every time I put on the tape, I'm like, yo, who's this kid wearing number six? Like this dude, I think might be better than both of these receivers who are going to go in the first round. And they both, I think, went, what, in the top 15? Top so 15. That was the way 15, I looked yeah. at him. Yeah, exactly. So that was the way I looked at him. I was like, man, this dude, I don't know how he's the number three or number four receiver on this team, but he looks like the best receiver on this team to me. And, I mean, you look at the numbers. The dude is incredible. He's such a crafty route runner. I love that Chad Johnson comp. I'm not too worried about the, you know, the skinny legs and the weight and all that weird <laughs> stuff. I feel like people kind of nitpick a little bit too much when it comes to this stuff. Look at the production. The dude was balling. He could do everything on a field. Uh, I think he's going to be a great you know, fit for whoever he goes to in this uh, draft. And I think ultimately it would be pretty disappointing to me if he's not a 1,000-yard one, 1, receiver you know, as a rookie. Yeah, and, and the reason I do favor <laughs> Chase over him is because of that ceiling aspect I see with Chase. I think Devontae Smith probably right now today is the better receiver, but I think Chase has a ways to go before he can become the better receiver. And you said 1,000 yards as a rookie for Devontae Smith. Definitely could see that coming yeah. because I think what he did to – NFL caliber corners that are going to go in the top three rounds in the Wade. NFL draft <laughs> this past year um, is going to translate quickly to the NFL. And, and we're going to stop using the word special after maybe the next pick after uh, this one, but Kyle Pitts also special. Yeah. So I, I'll, basically I'll what you get, what you get from Kyle Pitts is not what you get from any other tight end stands like George Kittle and a couple other guys in the NFL. The way that this dude can win when he split out wide, when he split into the slot, oh. when the way he wins after the catch, the way he wins, in ways that tight ends are not supposed to win. Tight ends are supposed to be red zone options. They're supposed to be possession receivers. They're not supposed to catch screen passes and break four tackles. Well, I'll tell you right now, I love Patrick Sertan. Don't get me wrong. Like He's a top three corner for me. I think, again, rightfully so, he's going to be a top 12 overall pick in this NFL draft. Kyle Pitts made him look foolish at times. Foolish. And it's just crazy to see a tight end with the blend of athleticism, with the blend of release at the line of scrimmage, with the blend of route running that Kyle Pitts already has is a 20-year-old kid. It's it's just insanity to think we're watching 
this might sound bold right now. I think we're personally watching a better version of Darren Waller who hasn't even hit the NFL yet. Kyle Pitts is going to be a top three overall player for me in this class. And I think that's valid. So again, I mentioned it when I was talking about Devonta Smith. I think if Kyle Pitts was classified as a receiver, he would be my one overall because he's just that freakish at that size. I mean, I just never seen that blend of sheer, uh, nuance with size and athleticism in college at the tight end position it makes no sense to me to even think of what Kyle Pitts is he's just, I'm just gonna say he's a monster to to be frank so yeah I mean, I mean the dude sorry. <laughs> no no the dude um and like you said this is the last one we're calling special no more special right um he is a special tight end prospect though yeah. I look back to you know a couple years ago the best tight end prospect I think I've ever seen in my lifetime uh, coming out of college was OJ Howard from Alabama, but yes, sir. I'm you know he was more of like your traditional. There you go. Yeah, I, your your team's got a couple of my guys, Chris Godwin too. But um, <laughs> he was more of a traditional. Put your hand in the dirt. Let me like you know. Let me attach myself to this tackle and run block and that kind of thing. But he could also obviously do it in the passing game. So when you look at Kyle Pitts, though, I like I like that Darren Waller comp. It's very similar. You know, I don't care about the designation of the tight end or receiver, whatever you want to call him. Just call him a weapon because this is a guy who's going to make plays uh, anywhere on the field. He's going to be a red zone threat, great hands, amazing route runner, great speed. Uh, he's he's definitely one of the best tight ends I think I've ever seen in my lifetime coming out and maybe the most nuanced weapon, I guess you could say, coming out at that tight end spot because I can't think of the last guy off the top of my head to uh, be that big of a receiving threat at the tight end spot. Yeah, yeah, and I seriously, you talked about OJ Howard. As a Bucks fan, that dude would have broken the absolute F out this year if he would have stayed healthy and not torn his Achilles. We'll have to see what happens when he comes back because it's a hard injury to come back from. But he his, his the first three games that he played, he looked freaking awesome. And he was a guy that was more so behind from a mental standpoint uh, in the NFL with the new transition to Bruce Arians' scheme. And that's why he didn't really uh, have the greatest season in 2019. But yeah, I, I really think um Kyle Pitts has that kind of potential I think he's that kind of prospect he's just so fluid for a guy his size it's just ridiculous um I think I'm gonna use the word special one last time for my next pick and it's not to describe the player as a whole but it's to describe one aspect of this player and that's Jalen Waddle because I think Jalen Waddle's speed and agility is the only he's the only player in the NFL that can rival Tyreek Hill's combination of speed and agility because we saw last year with Henry Ruggs, who was my number one receiver prospect in that draft, that you can have straight line speed, yes, but to have the quick twitch athleticism that Jalen Waddle has only puts you in Tyree Kill category when you have both things, when you have 4-2 speed plus that. And that's what Jalen Waddle brings to the table. He has underrated nuance as a route runner. And let's be honest, he's going to get open because of that speed and agility, whether he's good at running routes or not. And I think he also has an underrated verticality to his game, being able to go up high point the football and come down with it. Everyone remembers probably the catch he had against Mizzou where he jumped over like two defenders and came down with that ball. I think Jalen Waddle is the last guy in this tier for me um, that could be considered a special player. And uh, we've said this before. We think this year, this is the year to have first round fantasy picks in a super flex league for this reason, because as much as I love Rashad Bateman, I don't think his ceiling is as high as the 11 guys that we've talked about so far because he's more of like that that pro caliber receiver rather than a guy who's special in any one area. Um, but Jalen Waddle will be my 111 pick. He's my wide receiver three. And I think if deployed correctly, if he's in the right system, I think he can be the type of guy that can game break fantasy matchups for people. Yeah, I mean, we're mentioning just the metrics alone. 4.38 yards per route run in the games that he played last year phenomenal like absolutely absurd number and you mentioned the <laughs> yards after catch per reception we talked about it in the prospect battles but just ridiculous 10.1 yards after catch per reception for a guy who averaged 21 yards per that's reception two more per yards per reception than rondell moore averages on, on every reception not his yards after catch i mean the, the Jalen Waddle for the longest time was my wide receiver too. Again, we were talking about it from a fantasy basis, had to notch him a little bit under Jamar Chase because of that aspect. I still absolutely am in love with this guy's game. I think in the right situation you mentioned, I think his floor, this is going to sound very crazy for a guy who 
had a 1400 yard season in the past. I think his floor in the next level is going to be a TY Hilton type, the guy that can create separation with ease guy that has underrated verticality to his game and a guy that can make or break a game on any single catch. I've heard Brandon cooks is a floor for him. Like as a type of comparison for him too. I don't that hate makes sense that too. but yeah, what are your thoughts on Waddle Sosa? Yeah. I mean, he's got that game breaking speed that pretty much everyone's after these days, right? You looked at uh, the way Tyreek Hill, I don't want to necessarily say change the game, but I don't know how you guard guys like that, uh, you know, and at the end of the day, yeah. the ability to create big plays is always going to be the most valuable thing when it comes to fantasy football. So, you know, it's unfortunate for Waddle that he couldn't stay healthy this past year, but at the same time, you know, it just means that somebody who's can probably get a steal when it comes to the legitimate draft, as well as, you know, fantasy football drafts coming up here in uh, dynasty startups and kind of that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you look at the receiving yards per reception, fifth in college football last season, when, you know, he wasn't even healthy, uh, the yards yeah. per out run, you just mentioned it. I think he was third. Like, he's so productive, deep man. Production, and he's, he had like he's gonna win vertically. targets and like 300 yards and three touchdowns. Like, just ridiculous. <laughs> Insane. But like, yeah, the no, efficiency's uh, there. The tape is there. Uh, I'm impressed by him. I think somebody's going to get a really good player. And you know what? Honestly, I think the, the closer we get to the draft, I'm not going to be shocked if he does find his way, you know, creeping up. Closer to that receiver one spot, receiver two spot, similar to how Henry Ruggs did, I think, last season. Mm -hmm. uh, he might not be the most nuanced coming out right now, but in terms of the highest ceiling, like you mentioned, the highest projection, if we look back in a year or two, and um, you know, I wouldn't be shocked one bit if he does find his way to uh, that wide receiver one spot eventually. But uh, yeah, the dude's got game-breaking speed at the end of the day, and that's exactly what I think he's right now. Yep. Yeah. So you're up with the uh, the the, 12, 13. 12, the 201 the turn. We'll try and run through the second round a lot faster. Obviously, we got to talk about the big name dudes a little longer, so we'll try and uh, wrap this one up quicker. But who do you got for the 112 and the 201? Yeah, so I'm going next up here with uh, Rashad Bateman, the receiver out of Minnesota. Uh, just I don't I don't know how you can say it. just really safe. You know, I, no prospect is safe at the end of the day. No one's guaranteed nothing. But when I look at Rashad Bateman, I see Allen Robinson all over again, a dude that could just do everything really well maybe nothing special maybe nothing that you know is necessarily his calling card but a guy that can win vertically a guy that can win in the contested catch area um a guy who can make big plays you look at his breakout age very young his target share high as hell uh his dominator rating all these things like everything he encapsulates i think the tape checks the box the numbers check the box um and i'm excited about him i, I really think he's got a really safe and high floor projection in the NFL. And I think um, if you're looking for a guy who's going to give you that, not necessarily guaranteed, but very solid 11, 1200 type of floor uh, in terms of yards, I think Rashad Bateman is that guy. Yeah, I, I agree. Again, you mentioned the the players that we comped, Mike, or I, I, I spoiled Michael Thomas bit. is who Michael, I comped him to. So yeah, he he yeah, comped him to Michael Thomas. Possession mold. I, comped, I comped him to a guy like Keenan Allen as well. I mean, you mentioned those possession type receivers that can be, just be absolute safety blankets for the quarterback position. Uh, and you mentioned both those guys' ceilings have been in the right situation. Tremendous. You mentioned a guy, Michael Thomas, a couple of years ago, broke the actual NFL record for receptions in a season. And Keenan Allen, who's proven to be a, t a wide receiver one for the past, what, five years? I mean, if Rashad Bateman lands in that type of area where he can accumulate that amount of targets, I absolutely love the pick. I absolutely love the fit. And I think this guy's going to rest in that Allen Robinson range, as you mentioned, for his entire career. Absolutely one of the most safe prospects at the position in this draft. And 112 to get that type of security, I think, is a very good value in itself. But yeah, you got the back-to-back. -back. Who are you thinking at 201? Uh, this is yeah. This is, I think, where it gets a little bit fun. It's a little bit more yeah. um, like everyone's got their own guys at this kind of uh, the, this point in the draft. So I want to kind of go out on a limb here. I just took a safe prospect. I went with Rashad Bateman. So I'm going to double down and go a little bit more risky here and go with Rondale Moore. I knew he was going to do he it. Just uses <laughs> so much ability. <laughs> you know, I consider a few other guys, but I'm just I love high end projection. You know, you look at a guy that came in as a freshman in 2018 and just absolutely absurdly dominated college football. This guy was 18 years old, just look, making grown men look like fools. And uh, you look at the tackle breaking ability, the ability with the ball in his hands, man, it's special. It reminds me kind of like a, uh, a DJ Moore, similar when he was coming out, you know, he's not going to um, coming out of college. He, it's a very questionable usage. I think he had like 48 screens in 2018, which is never going to happen yeah. in the NFL. You're not going to catch 48 screens, but um, a guy that doesn't project 
Uh, it's harder to project, I guess, to the NFL in terms of his usage. But when you look at just the ability with the ball in his hands, his ability to actually create separation uh, and to create yards after the catch, I think it's very similar to a guy like DJ Moore when he was coming out. And uh, you've seen DJ Moore now. I mean, he's one of the best receivers in the NFL. I don't think he has any troubles getting vertical, actually running a full route tree, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, Rondale Moore, physical freak, a guy that I would trust at this point in the draft. Uh, I think the high end projection is very, very enticing here. And uh, that's exactly why I'm going to call it in there. Yeah, no, yeah, I, so, okay. Let me just let me just say my Rondell Moore spiel because everyone knows I don't like Rondell Moore. And the reason I don't like Rondell Moore is you mentioned DJ Moore. Well, the difference between those two guys is about 40 pounds and like four inches of height. So one, you have a you have a size concern with Rondell Moore. I, I'm not under the impression that he has the greatest like instincts or like, and this is like super nitpicky, right? Like I see the high end projection for Rondell yeah. Moore. I can see him being that weapon for an offense, like a shifty slot receiver. I think the guy I compare him to most is like a guy like Tavon Austin, who if Tavon Austin went to the right situation could have definitely been a very electric uh, player. But my kind of qualm with him is that I think he's way more, uh, way better and way more productive from an NFL perspective as opposed to for fantasy. So I think I have an, a number of guys ahead of him, but I'm warming on uh, warming up on him a little bit. I, I think he needs to clean up his hands a little bit. He has, uh, some issues with drops. He also had some medical concerns. The reason he hasn't played much in these last two seasons uh, after his breakout freshman year. So he just checks a lot less boxes than some of the guys I have ranked ahead of him. That's really all it comes down to for me, but I definitely see the high end projection for him. Yeah. I mean, I, at, at this point in the draft at the 201, you take a shot at a guy with upside and I've mentioned it. If Rondale Moore, the way I kind of see him being used in the NFL, if he can land in a spot similar to what Debo Samuel got, in San Francisco can be used in multiple facets of the game can be used in real situations where he can create for himself after the catch in the intermediate game. I think he could be a tremendous fantasy asset. You mentioned Debo Samuel a couple of years ago was performing at a top 15 level ending that season. If he lands on a team, let's just say hypothetically the jets, the jets have Michael fur coming in. Michael fur, as we've seen, has had the tutelage of learning under some of the best innovators in the entire NFL. I think if he lands in a spot with a guy like Mike LaFleur, who knows how to use his athletes and knows how to use, knows how to get them the ball in space, I think he can be an absolute stud there. Again, I have some questions about his overall game, but you mentioned if this guy lands in the right spot, he can absolutely break a game. So I absolutely see the appeal. I absolutely see the upside. And again, at 201, you take the swing on a guy with that that amount of upside. I'm fine with it 100%. Yep. Yeah. So speaking of upside, we're going to go with the opposite of upside right now. And I'm going to take Mac Jones. Because this is a super flex league, I think Mac Jones is, is pretty overrated personally. I think he's a guy that was really aided by his offense, really aided by the weapons that he had. But this is a super flex league, and if Mac Jones is a first-round pick and a high first-round pick by the sounds of it amongst NFL draft circles, he is going to have an opportunity to be a starter in this league for two to three, potentially even more than that, years. And we've talked about Kirk Cousins, kind of Derek Carr. If you drafted Derek Carr back in 2014 in the early second round in a super flex league, you would have been happy with that pick because a guy like Derek Carr is what I see out of Mac Jones, and he could give you mid – uh, QB2, high-end QB2 type of production in the right situation. And I think there's a number of teams in that 19, 20, potentially even higher um, or later in the first round range that need quarterbacks. And if he goes to a situation like that, I could definitely see him being productive as like a uh, as a low-end kind of QB2 type. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Again, he is the typical uh, lock down your quarterback two type position for the long haul. You mentioned a guy who should get top 20 type draft capital. I think his absolute floor is probably at 20 overall to Chicago. If no team actually trades up for him again, I'm not a huge fan of Mac Jones overall game. He doesn't actually possess the Konami code that those top four guys do. However, if you can tell me right now, I can get a Kirk cousins type of output for the next four years at the what 203 in my rookie draft. I'll take that 100% of the time because at the end of the day here, the 203 is the absolute floor that his value is going to be for a guy who is going to produce top 16 to 20 quarterback numbers on a yearly basis. So I like the pick. I'm not a huge fan, as you mentioned, with the player himself. I actually have a late two on him. I think he's kind of limited in terms of what he can give in an offense. But you mentioned draft capital situation. He should be a starter for a good amount of years. I'm fine with it, and I, I, he would have been my pick as well. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with you what you guys said. You know, he's not very exciting. He's a little bit more boring. Uh, but when you look at like the anticipation, the ability to throw the ball with accuracy, 
Um, all the things that are exciting, but it's very hard to project. You know, he obviously was thrown to a lot of talented guys at Alabama. Didn't have to come off his first read a lot. Those guys were creating a lot of separation. It's going to be very different if you go to, you know, the Chicago Bears. You don't exactly have a bunch of first round picks there. So um, tough to say, you know, without knowing where he's going to go, how he's going to project. But definitely if you're looking for a quarterback, too, with a higher floor, a guy who's going to be more safe. Uh, Kirk Cousins, like like you guys mentioned, I think it's a very good pick here. Yeah, yeah if he doesn't get first round draft capital, he will not be a top two round pick for me in uh, Superflex draft. So he needs to get that first round draft capital from an NFL draft perspective to be this high. So Danny, who are you up? Uh, you got two uh, back-to-back picks. I have a feeling I know who one of them is because you stole my guy. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you can you can already see it on the board right now. Let me just uh, quickly adjust it. And, oh, I screwed up regardless. The two picks that I'm going to be going with here, as you see, Elijah Moore, wide receiver from Ole Miss. And Michael Carter, the other UNC running back. Taking both my guys, then. I'm taking. Well, they're my next two on my board, so I got to stay true to the board, stay true to the value. And let me tell you, as I always say, Elijah Moore is an absolute stud. He's my current wide receiver five, as we've both mentioned multiple times in this NFL draft. He is the most slept-on receiver in this entire class. You mentioned. Yes, the majority of his snaps do come in the slot, but you're talking about a guy who can step in day one, and just give you an instant contributor from that position. You mentioned all the metrics favor him. He's a, a concise, smart road runner, can do a lot after the catch. And quite frankly, for a guy of his size and stature, he is a tough motherfucker. You mentioned he's making plays across the middle of the field like nobody's business. Watching Matt Corral and him link up on a daily ba- or on a weekly basis was an absolute delight to watch during the season. And uh, it'll absolutely be fun to watch him on Sundays with him being on my team now. But uh, Sosa, what are your thoughts on Eli Moore? Yeah, I also think he's a little bit underrated, to be honest. But, you know, with the way the NFL and the college games are going now, it's a lot of passing games, right? It's going to be a lot of receivers and quarterbacks that are going to come out that are going to be productive in rounds two, three, whatever it may be. And so um, you talk about a guy that's a target hog coming out of the slot. That's very exciting, obviously, especially in PPR style leagues where if you can get, you know, some points per reception, he's going to have that little value boost. Uh, you look at the efficiency, very efficient player in terms of the missed tackles, force things like that. Um, so I'm excited about his projection too. I think, like you said, he's going to slot into uh, somebody's slot position from day one, and probably start from day one, be a very productive receiver right out of the gate. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Butch, you can touch upon your guy as well. He, he's my dude. Danny stole my dude. I love Elijah. Yeah, I like Moore. Him too. I've often said he's the better of the more receivers in this draft class. Um, but what I see with Elijah Moore is basically everything you can say out of Rondo Moore, except I see that dog mentality. I see that guy that's going to. Uh, if he makes a catch in your face, he's going to get up and tell you how much better he is than you. And I don't see that out of Rondell Moore um, from time to time. But I, I love Elijah Moore. I have no qualms with the pick. Michael Carter, we could talk about briefly, too. Yeah, I think I mean, another one of my guys, Michael Carter is a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. I will call it right now. That is who they're going to pick in the second round. Um, I think he's not and, and Jason Light are going to love that dude um, because of what he provides in the receiving game. You know how many times I watch Ronald Jones and Leonard Fournette drop passes? This season, they they need a guy who can contribute in the receiving game, and I think Michael Carter is the type of guy, or the guy I can, I'm about to pick next actually is the type of guy that they are going to gravitate towards in the draft. So, with that being said, I'm going to take Kenneth Gainwell next. Um, he's a guy that I also think is going to be a primary uh, third down back in the NFL. If you play in any kind of PPR league, he's obviously going to have some value from that perspective. I think he is totally landing spot dependent, though. I could see him going anywhere from the the early second round, late first round to the back of the second round, depending on where he goes. So if he goes to a situation where, for example, uh, Aaron Jones maybe is gone in Green Bay and A.J. Dillon is the primary ball carrier there and Jamal Williams is also gone and they draft a Kenneth Gainwell, that's like an ideal situation for him. Or, for example, if he goes to Tampa Bay, as I mentioned, I think Kenneth Gainwell, Michael Carter, both guys that offer a lot on third down they're also very elusive runners in their own right they can run between the tackles when they need to but probably not guys you want to be featuring with 20 carries a game yeah no 100 uh again gainwell and carter was a, a big decision for me as well i uh, i do prefer carter slightly i kind of see as as we've mentioned multiple times kind of see a, a more uh better in terms of the speed game to or faster, I can just say version of CEH, but uh, yeah, no, Gainwell is, is a phenomenal player in his own right. You mentioned those Memphis backs breed football, and we've seen it in multiple years right now. Daryl Henderson, my boy Tony Pollard, and of course, last year as well, Antonio Gibson. He kind of fits that mold in the sense that they he can do a lot. Antonio Gibson to the bench for a lot of the time, too. Yeah, 
I mean, he fits the mold of Memphis running back, explosive in space, good in the receiving game. All those Memphis running backs are, <laughs> I don't want to like classify them as quote unquote the same, but they all excel in similar areas of the, of the game. And Kenneth Gainwell is no different. What are your thoughts on him, uh, Sosa? Yeah, I think you guys summed it up well, to be honest. I don't know what's up with uh, Memphis and those kind of running backs. They're all very similar, like <laughs> you guys mentioned. Uh, good in space, good with the ball in their hands. Pretty much like pseudo receivers, to be quite honest with you. And, um, you know, it's always exciting when, when you're in fantasy football. You're always looking for guys with pass game upside, specifically out of the backfield. Uh, and I, I like it. You know, I like the projection to the NFL as well for Gainwell, similar to an Antonio Gibson, where, you know, these guys can – eventually get taught more of the uh, process of being a running back. But at the end of the day, they do have that high upside from and, and that high floor from being receiving backs. And at the end of the day, you know, if you can slot into a team that's going to be uh, playing with a quarterback like an Alex Smith or someone who's willing to dump the ball off, you know, then your projection becomes even better. So um, I like that pick. And I guess that puts me up next on the board. And this one's a little bit tougher for me. Um, you know, I, I'm probably going to go receiver here. I think I'll go with uh, Kadarius Tony at this spot, probably out of Florida. Not very productive in college, obviously. Uh, he had three years where he didn't really do much at all. Uh, this past season was his most productive. But, you know, I like his ability to run routes. I like his ability to create yardage after the catch. And then when you look at um, him at the Senior Bowl, where, you know, he went with a lot of the other top products in the country, I thought he did a very good job staying out there. He looked explosive. Uh, was not very easy to cover for the cornerbacks. I thought he did a good job separating. So, you know, at this spot, I, I wanted to go with a few other names potentially, but I'm going to go with Kadarius Tony. I think he could be a late first round pick in the draft. And ultimately, yeah. uh, if you are picked that high, I'm sure he's going to be starting for, you know, from day one for somebody. So I'll go with Kadarius Tony, but there were a few other receivers that were at the back of my mind here. Yeah, 100%. You're mentioning Kadarius Tony's game. What he does in terms of, elite twitchiness, elite separation, elite route running. I mean, you mentioned the draft capital. I mean, I think he could step in right away and absolutely demand targets from that slot position. You mentioned a team like Washington made sense for Elijah Moore. I think Washington makes a lot of sense for Kadarius Tony as well. You mentioned teams later on in that first round. Uh, Green let's just Bay, say New Orleans, Kansas like City. That. Kansas City makes City, a lot yeah. of sense too. So yeah, no, I, I definitely see the appeal. I think Kadarius Tony is absolutely one of the most exciting players to watch in this entire class and if he gets that draft capital he gets that landing spot i absolutely like it in terms of a schematic fit to what he can do at the nfl level yeah and i think this entire kind of range of the draft too is like one it's your guys but it's also a lot of landing spot related things too we saw last year guys like michael pittman jr rise up uh, boards because of the potential volume that he could have seen in indianapolis a lot of players kind of uh experience that as well so yeah, I don't mind the pick of Kadarius Tony here. There's like 11 slot receivers in this class that are 5'9", 190 pounds. They're all twitchy as shit. So um, the, the, we kind of just sound like a broken record talking about them. But so, so you're on the board again. Who are you taking? Oh, this one is even tougher for me. I, I'm really at my spot <laughs> now. But um, I'm going to go with Dwayne Eskridge here. I, it's, I know it's a big okay, curveball. I like um, it. Oh, man, when you're talking about guys that can win with the ball in their hands, that can work vertical, create big plays, uh, you can manufacture touches for them in, in the screen game. Uh, you can set him vertical, let him go deep and win deep. Uh, he can really do everything. And, you know, that doesn't even mention the real impact of actually being a return man as well. I'm just super intrigued by his ability to create big plays. Uh, obviously, the landing spots can be very important. But, man, if, if you could get him to a place like Green Bay or, you know, with a quarterback that's going to be willing to push the ball deep somewhere like that, um, even, even, you know, even my Rams with Matthew Stafford, yeah. Get him to a quarterback that's going to be willing to push the ball vertical. Let him make plays deep down the field. You know, manufacture some touches for him in the screen game and let him go create yak because that's what he does best. Yeah, no, Asker is just an absolute delight to watch. I mean, you mentioned this guy. I swear, we, we hit the nail on the head with this one. That's the phrase I was looking for earlier. Um, just guys that are that 5'9", slimmer build that can just absolutely create. There's an abundance of them. We're still in the like class. four more in this draft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Eskridge absolutely fits the bill. I mean, you mentioned this guy is an absolute exciting game breaker. And he's been getting a lot of buzz from NFL draft circles. I would not be shocked if we're talking about a guy who gets that top 45 type draft capital. And if that's the case, he lands in a spot. Let's just say hypothetically the Jets were to get him. I mean, I mentioned the Jets for Rondell Moore, but an exciting team that could use that uh, feature for a young quarterback. I absolutely love the fit for a guy in Dwayne Eskridge. 
I think he's going to go a lot higher than a lot of casual fans think that he will in the draft. If that's the case, give me all the Dwayne Eskridge possible. Yeah, he's like the anti-analytics guy because he broke out late and everyone hates that. But the NFL ironically uh, values recent production over production when you're 18 years old, like Rondell Moore, which, I mean, makes more sense to me. But uh, I think, yeah, Eskridge, you, hit the, you basically talked about it. You summed him up. He's, he's another one of those speed demon, get the ball in his hand type of players that are plentiful in this draft class. So I'm actually going to pivot away from that type of player, but I'm going to stay at the wide receiver position. And I'm going to take Diami Brown here because I think Diami Brown is a guy that checks a lot of boxes for me. When you when you talk about ability to win downfield, that's basically his calling card. A lot of his production came from downfield play. He is not as physical as I wanted to see from a guy. He's a little bit slimmer build as well. He's one of those 185 pound types, about six foot one. So he's a guy that can win off the line of scrimmage. But I found in contested uh, contested catch situations wasn't as physical I'd like to see, but. He is definitely a guy that can win on the outside, barely played in the slot at all because of Daz Newsom. And I think he could go to a situation that already has an established number one on that team and really be a field stretcher, wide receiver three type in fantasy, similar to a guy like DJ Chark potentially. Um, if you were to go to maybe Tennessee across from AJ Brown, maybe he goes to Green Bay across from Devontae Adams, maybe something like that where he can win down the field and, and let his number one receiver get the majority of the targets. Yeah, no, 100%. Diami Brown is an absolute delight to watch. And uh, a lot of people, when they're when they're watching receivers, they're like, oh, well, why did, why wasn't this guy using the slot in college? Because that, that does apply to Diami Brown. When you look at the actual context of the situation, you got Daz Newsom running 97% of his snaps in the slot. He's going to be relegated to that outside-only role. But let me tell you, Diami Brown, he can win on the outside. And that's what you look for a lot of these guys coming into the draft nowadays. They can't win – on the outside on a regular snap to snap basis and diami brown can absolutely do so again you mentioned exciting with the ball in his hands can track the ball deep uh in the vertical game i think diami brown is one of the absolute most exciting players in this draft he's very he was very productive too which is an underrated part of his his profile he's still a young player and he was very productive at yeah. young age too which the analytics heads really like so Danny, you're on the board, and we got four more picks before we close out the round here. So this is when you can really just reach on guys just so that we can talk about them. I have uh, two picks and three guys I want with these two picks. So I'm at a decision right here. I'll just outline the three guys I'm really staring at right now are Terrace Marshall out of LSU, Amonra St. Brown out of USC, and Tylen Wallace out of Oklahoma State. So uh, I'm going to pick here. <sighs> You know what? Let me just do it. I'm going to take Terrace Marshall first, wide receiver out of LSU, and kind of the forgotten guy when you think of the LSU receiving corps. I mean, we mentioned Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase this year. Terrace Marshall is an absolute phenom in his own right. I mean, what we've seen from him uh, prior to him uh, ending up opting out, I mean, he was absolutely dominating on a game-to-game -game basis for LSU. I mean, we're mentioning a guy who – I'm just going to pull up his numbers right now. I believe he had about 700 yards and seven touchdowns. 700 yards and 10 touchdowns in the six games he played this year. You're just mentioning a guy on, on a snap to snap basis was absolutely winning down the field, has the necessary athleticism, has the frame. And a guy, we're mentioning draft capital, he is viewed at by the NFL as a top five to seven receiver, basically unanimously on a lot of boards that I've been seeing. So if that's the case and he lands in a spot, let's just say hypothetically, Kansas City wants to diversify their uh, receiving room and want to get that big target to complement what Tyreek Hill does. I think Terrace Marshall can absolutely do that. Again, his struggles have mostly to do with the uh, yards after the catch type game, but I think in terms of winning down the field, in terms of verticality, in terms of size, in terms of hands, I think he can provide you that ultimate blanket next to what a guy like Tyreek Hill does. No, I'm only talking about one landing spot, but it just makes a lot of sense in my head. Either way, Terrace Marshall here in the late second round for a guy that should go as high as I anticipate, I think would be an absolute value as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on Marshall, uh, Sosa? Yeah, you know, I think you did a good uh, job of summing it up. And obviously when you're playing with, you know, in an offense with guys like Justin Jefferson and, and Jamar Chase, you're never really going to get the uh, the pub that you deserve or, or even the targets that you deserve. But um, he's a very talented player. He's got good size. I like his hands. I think he uh, has good physicality for the position. So, um, and like you mentioned, he's been productive, and it's been a couple of years of productivity now in you know pretty good conference, obviously in the SEC. So, uh, I like to pick here, and ultimately, you know, we're all kind of going with our guys at this point. So, um, you know, I like to pick. Yep. Uh, how about you, Corey? What are you thinking? 
I, you basically summed it up. The, the only problem I have with the dude, as you mentioned, is his ability after the catch. And he, he kind of seems a little stiff to me, but I think he kind of wins short a lot. And he also wins um, down the field as well. So I think he has a role in the NFL. What I just don't like about Terrace Marshall personally, as I wear an LSU sweater uh, of Devin white is um, I, I just don't think he has that high of a ceiling. I kind of see him as like a Rashard Higgins type of receiver at the, at the next level. I think, he can be a productive role player for an offense. I just don't think he has like wide receiver one, even wide receiver two consistent uh, potential as a, a fantasy asset. That's fair. I, I personally view him as like that wide receiver two type, like on an offense. I, again, I agree. He would never be a, a featured receiver on offense, but you're mentioning if he was in a support role for a guy like Tyree kill, I think that'd be a very good fit for him. He can win on the outside gangbusters size. Uh, I do like that. And to pivot off of that, my next pick is going to be a Monroe St. Brown from USC. I think this guy can step in right away and have a Tyler Boyd type impact in the right situation. You mentioned he's not really special in every any single category of his game, but he just kind of does everything pretty well. I mean, you mentioned he can run that slot for a team at the next level. I think that's ultimately good what his role is going to end up being. Just that underneath weapon that could win, consistent, a guy that the quarterback can rely upon. What basically Tyler Boyd has been making top 25 fantasy success at for the last three years. And you're mentioning the draft capital. I like alluding to it. Another guy that should be t- getting in the top 50 of the NFL draft. I think Amon or St. Brown is going to be a very solid contributor no matter where he goes. Yeah, I think he's going to have a similar type of – like last year we saw the uh, the wide receiver run when Pittman went off the board and a number of other guys went off the board from like 20 to 45. I think there's going to probably be a similar run in this draft class as well. And Amon or St. Brown kind of fits that mold of a receiver that goes in the mid-second round that can be very productive as he steps in. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, the USC man Sosa? Yeah, I view him really similar as you guys, you know, uh, probably a mid second round pick, high second round pick, uh, a guy who can come into an offense. I think it'd be a solid receiver too. You know, he's not probably going to be that high end receiver one in anyone's offense, but when it comes to a guy that has pretty good size, uh, you know, I think he could play pretty much all over the field. Um, still young and he's got, you know, pretty good bloodline too. I know, um, his brother's yeah. obviously in the NFL with the Green Bay Packers, <laughs> Equinemius. I think they're, yeah, his dad's his dad absolutely a, yoked out of his mind. <laughs> Mr. Universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, they got a pretty good bloodline. So, um, you know, I like the pick here as well. Uh, I think he's a guy that had a pretty good college career, but I wouldn't be shocked if he ends up having a better, uh, pr- more productive NFL career. I, I view him as that kind of a player. Yeah. That hits the nail on the head of what I believe as well. I mean, you mentioned a guy in the right situation, 1, 1,100 type yards, similar to a Tyler Boyd. Uh, I absolutely agree. And yeah, getting him at the end of the second round, I'm pretty stoked with that value. But aside from that, I believe, Corey, you're back on the clock here at the 211. What are you looking at right now on the board? I'm going to probably reach just so I can talk about this guy. But the reason I'm going to do it is because this is the most important position in fantasy, in my opinion, even in a super flex league. And that's the running back position. So I'm going to take two Robert. So, and the reason I'm going to take Chuba Hubbard is because I think we don't have a lot of information on Chuba Hubbard's situation, right? It was a very down season for him, obviously. He looked terrible. And I, my first conclusion when watching his film this year is like, this guy is hurt. There's no way this guy is healthy when I'm watching this guy's film because the way he looked in 2019, the way he was able to make people miss, the way he was able to break away a lot of plays, I didn't see that this year. And it came out in a story that he had, he was dealing with an ankle injury and he was consistently having painkillers before games and stuff. I think the NFL is going to get the correct medical information on Chuba Hubbard and they're going to weigh his 2019 output a lot higher than the fantasy community and Twitter wants to weigh it. So it wouldn't shock me if Chuba Hubbard is a second round pick in the NFL draft or a third round pick in the NFL draft. And we all know that top three round draft capital is really the sweet spot for the running back position. So if he's able to get that high of draft capital and the team really convinces themselves that 2019 Chuba Hubbard is the real Chuba Hubbard, then I think he's going to be a very underrated fantasy asset because a lot of people have written him off. Yeah. Good. Canada represent. we got three Canadian lads on the pod. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I was the biggest Chuba Hubbard supporter in 2019. Obviously 2020 was nowhere near the type of player that he was uh, the year before, but yeah, again, you hit the nail on the head here. I do think he was playing with some type of injury kind of had that scuffle with his head coach going into the season as well. I don't know. It just kind of seemed like the season was really forced on him and he didn't really look as explosive as elusive as he was the previous year and 
yeah, again, a lot of people in the fantasy community are down on him because of that, but I don't think the NFL is going to weigh this season as heavy as a lot of people anticipate. Again, 2019, you talked about a guy who had 2,100 rushing yards and over 20 rushing touchdowns. I mean, he was absolutely dominant in the games he played in. So, again, you mentioned a guy who should be going in that top 75, let's just say, as a baseline for him. I absolutely think that is the case and getting him – here with a guy that should be going that high at the end of the second round, I do think is a really good value spot for him. But uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on Hubbard Sosa? Yeah, I think you guys pretty much summed it up real well there. Um, obviously, very disappointing season. And uh, the injury thing would make a lot of sense because he obviously didn't look anywhere nearly as explosive as I think we pretty much all became um, used to, you know, from Hubbard. Uh, 2019 and 2020 kind of looked like a completely different player. And, you know, when you think about the potential for the injury and obviously the coaching stuff, um, and the whole COVID year, obviously, it's, it's been a weird season for him. But when you talk about a guy that just has a lot of explosion and can take the, the ball to the house pretty much on any given touch, you know, I, I value him as well. I'm, I'm curious to see how the NFL values him, if he's going to be a running back one for somebody in terms of coming in as a rookie and actually getting the ball, or is he going to be more of a backup, change of pace style of guy? But I think a lot of that's going to help dictate, you know, kind of the output that he's going to be able to have as a rookie. But um, I guess that puts me up here at the last pick. And... Uh, I, I got to go with my guy. You know, I thought about, I thought, I thought about going uh, Tylen Walls here, but I just got to go with my guy. My guy, Amari Rogers, the receiver out of Clemson. I don't know what it is about these slot receivers. Um, they just <laughs> know their way into my heart. I guess I'm something of that uh, higher PPR floor kind of a guy. I want a guy who's going to get a lot of receptions. Uh, you look at a guy that has, I think, some of the most underrated route running ability in this class. A lot of shake to his game. Has the ability to separate. I think he can make plays down the field. Uh, obviously doesn't have you know tremendous size or anything but when you're talking about a guy that can uncover he can separate uh, he can make plays down the field he's got good hands he went to the senior bowl and made absolutely everyone look foolish there um this is a guy i think projects well into the nfl i think if you can get him to a spot where he could just be a slot receiver for somebody you know uh, yeah i don't want to say cole beasley like but something similar to that where you just plug him in let him do his thing he's going to be productive every game and uh, i think he's gonna have a long and productive career now he might not have the high end that some of these other guys do but uh, if we're talking about a guy with a very safe projection, in my opinion, I think Amari Rogers is pretty much that. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head here. I actually wrote up Trevor Lawrence in our draft guide, and every single time I was watching him play, I'm like, oh my God, like Amari Rogers is absolutely a joy to watch. The way he shakes defenders, the way he's just an absolute jitterbug in the open space. I mean, you mentioned it, you hit the nail on the head here. I think he can absolutely dominate from the slot from day one and you mentioned the senior bowl as well i mean this kid is just special in that regard in terms of his just twitchiness in terms of you're not taking me down you're like you're the first guy here guess what see you later pal i'm getting right past you that's what amari rogers represents to me and uh you mentioned that the draft capital is going to go on that day two of the nfl draft that's exactly what we look for so getting him here uh you mentioned i i think it's a very good spot for him as well i, I currently have him actually as my number 24 overall player. So that basically aligns directly with the value he was taking in this mock. Yeah. If, um, if we, I'm, I just want to mention Pat Fryermuth probably would have been a, another pick for me if I had another pick in this range, just because I think he is, uh, he's that type of tight end, maybe like Cole Komet last year, that can be a productive tight end in the NFL, probably never going to be an elite fantasy tight end like Kyle Pitts will, but he definitely could be that Kyle Rudolph. Uh, Zach Ertz in a great situation type of tight end that gets a lot of target volume, scores some touchdowns, and is great for PPR leagues. So I just wanted to m mention Friar Muth as an honorable mention to this. But if you guys made it to this point in the video, we need you to right now, you have to say, hit the nail on the head in the comments section because Danny probably said it 78 times in this video. So <laughs> if you guys comment that, that helps us out tremendously in the, uh, the SEO uh, of the YouTube video. So like this video. If you guys enjoyed, go check out everything that Sosa is doing at PFF. All of his links will be in the description as well as his Twitter is on the screen right now. So um, if that, uh, with that being said, guys, peace out and enjoy your Tuesday. Happy birthday to Danny as well. Peace out, y'all. Yeah, comment that as well. See ya.